Okay, hi everyone, it's Dr. Lindner. Today uh, we'll be talking about the introduction to the neural system and we will also talk about the brain and neuron today. So introduction, neuron, brain, and then we'll meet again and we will do the spinal cord and then we'll meet again and we'll do some of the special senses, primarily focusing on the ear and the eye. Uh, we'll probably review some of the cranial nerves again because there's some special senses there as well. So I'm gonna share my screen. And what we will do is, let's go, let me open up. All right, so what we're going to show you is some of the files uh, that we'll be going over. Okay, so we're gonna be looking at exam four file folder and we have, I'm gonna be looking at this first, the brain and cranial nerve PowerPoint. Uh, then we will look at the brain model, label 2020, we'll look at that as well as the neuron model. And then the following week, we will look at the spinal cord and the spinal nerves and the reflex arc. And then the week after that, we'll do the special senses, okay? Um, wanna make you aware that I do have videos here. If you click on that folder, in terms of special senses, there's video here on the eye uh, and the ear that I did. There's also a video already done on the brain, the neuron and the reflex arc. Another video on the cervical spine uh, cross-section of the cord. When we talk about the brain, you'll see a lot of pictures of this, right? And then you'll be able to look at it from the inside as well. And when we talk about the brain, you'll also see another cross-section that looks something like this as well. I have an arsenal of all these lab models because I do teach online so I have access to a lot of these um, and then I have some others uh, some are not done by me but these are uh, the video of the cervical spine the neuron these are all by me I think the video of the neuron is not the video uh, gross anatomy of the spinal cord that's not done by me and the video of the inner ear and eye these are additional but not done by, by me but great uh, tutorials for you, okay? Um, let's go and get right into the brain. Um, actually, I want to talk about a few definitions first, okay? Um, a few definitions that I'd like to cover would be the terms uh, nucleus, ganglion, or ganglia, and then axon and nerve. Those are the four key definitions. And the first one would be a nucleus. And a nucleus is a group of nerve cell bodies within the CNS. A group of nerve cell bodies located within the CNS. A group of nerve cell bodies located within the CNS. When I say CNS, it means central neural system. The central neural system is everything centrally located. It's the brain and the spinal cord. That's the CNS. Anything outside of that is the PNS, which is peripheral neural system. Again, the CNS is only the brain and the spinal cord, nothing else. 
the PNS and peripheral neural system is everything else outside of that, meaning spinal nerves, median nerve, sciatic nerve, cranial nerves, anything outside of the spinal cord, not within the spinal cord, but outside moving peripheral is the PNS. Okay, so a nucleus is a group of nerve cell bodies located within the CNS, a ganglia is a group of nerve cell bodies located in the PNS. So very similar definition, except we're talking about geography here, location, location, location. It's a group of nerve cell bodies located outside of the CNS or in the peripheral neural system in the PNS. That is a ganglia. Then we have, um, what are the other two definitions? Nerve and axons. Um, not nerve and axons, what's the, oh, uh, sorry. Um, I want a uh, nerve and tracts, my bad, nerve and tracts. So tract, a tract, T-R-A-C-T, a tract is a group of axons located in the CNS. A tract is a group of axons in the CNS. And a nerve is a group of axons in the PNS. Again, a tract is a group of axons located in the central neural system, and a nerve is a group of axons located in the peripheral neural system. Okay, so now we have some uh, of basic, basic terminology. Um, the other thing about the neural system, besides those uh, introductory terms, is that the neural system develops about 18 days after conception. So after sperm and egg comes together at about day 18, um, we have the first structure that shows up which is the brain and the spinal cord, but it's not called the brain and the spinal cord that early on in fetal development. Uh, it starts off as something called a primitive streak, and then it becomes a notochord, and the notochord uh, becomes a spinal cord. So it's the very, very first system that develops embryologically, uh, where most people think it's the heart, right? Many people think that, that life begins when there's the heartbeat, but, uh, it's the neural system, which is the highway of communication that actually branches out where you have a brain, a spinal cord, and then nerves that come out, which is kind of like a tree where you have roots, a trunk, and branches of a tree. And then at the very end of the branches, like we see now uh, during springtime, we have buds that form on the end of branches. And embryologically, when we talk about the neural system, at the end of the nerves, we have, they're also called buds. Uh, if it's a heart bud, it grows into the heart. If it's the kidney buds, it grows into the kidneys. And it's the eye buds, they grow into the eyes. So the brain sends messages down the spinal cord, goes to the nerve, and that neurological output goes to the end organs and helps to maintain homeostasis and function. It is a disconnect between the brain and the organ where things start to malfunction. So if the brain is sending a message down my spinal cord to my heart and it's telling it to beat a certain number of beats per minute or going to my lungs and telling it uh, how many respirations per minute and how long the pause should be between my breath, between inspiration and expiration, if the messages get there uninterrupted, that's great, but if there's interference between the brain and the organ, then that's where things start to malfunction. And that malfunction is a dis-ease process that takes a lot of time to accumulate in the body until eventually a symptom shows up, and uh, then we, we give it a name, we give that disease a name. But if you think about most uh, imbalances to the body, if the thyroid is working too slow, it's a hypoactive thyroid. If it's working too fast, it's a hyperactive thyroid. If the heart is beating too slow or too fast, 
to tachycardia or bradycardia. If you're having bowel movements that are too slow, it's constipation. If it's too fast, it's diarrhea. Everything is that homeostasis where it's too much or too little of something, all under the control of neurological function and endocrine function. The neural system is called the master system because it is the master system. It controls everything. And if there's any defect or interference or blockages to the neurological pathway, then uh, we have a problem. So we always want a clear pathway from brain down the spinal cord to the nerve, to the muscles, to the glands, to the organs and all the tissues to have a healthy individual. Okay. Um, in other terminology become familiar with is afferent and efferent. Uh, afferent, if you think about your neural system, it's, it's like a computer, it's processing information, right? We take in information, the information comes in, it ascends or goes up to my brain. My brain is a processor, it processes that information. And then it sends out information and goes to all of my body parts and tells it what to do. So I'm taking in information. Maybe I'm taking information about danger around me and the stress around me. And as my body takes in this information, it processes that maybe I'm in a dangerous situation. So output goes out to my heart and to my lungs, to my blood vessels to speed and accelerate everything up. So um, as the information comes in and ascends up to my brain, that's all sensory information. That's all sensory input. When we talk about information that's going down, that's efferent information or motor information. So think of it as like, a, um, think of it as a, an elevator. So as the elevator is going up or the information goes up my spinal cord to my brain, that's ascending information or afferent with an A, A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, afferent information, which is sensory. And all of that sensory information ends up going to a part of the brain. Let me just find it for you because I'm looking at it this way. Okay number here, which is number seven, which is called a post-central gyrus. If there's a post-central gyrus, there's a pre-central gyrus. So right here, it looks like number six and number seven, number six and number seven. In between six and seven, right here, there is a central sulcus. And in front of the central sulcus is a pre-central gyrus, and behind it is a post-central gyrus. So all of that sensory input, as it goes into the brain, as it ascends and goes up into my brain, all of that sensory input is gonna end up at the post-central gyrus then my brain makes a decision as to what it's going to do. It's going to send information out to have some sort of motor command. And that motor command is an efferent message, which is going out, efferent, descending, or motor. So ascending, afferent, sensory, efferent, descending, motor. Now, as all of that information ascends, it goes to that post-central gyrus and pre-central gyrus. And I want to show you, let's see if I could bring up an image here. Post-central. Uh, let me bring this up differently. I want to type up homunculus brain. Okay, this is a good image here. Uh, 
Okay, let me do a screen share again. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. And what I want you to see here is the picture on the right hand side, right in here, this is a bird's eye view of looking down on the brain. So this is the left hemisphere of the, of the cerebrum. And this is the right hemisphere of the cerebrum. This is anterior and this is posterior. So right here in the red, on the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere is the precentral gyrus. And in blue is the post central gyrus. And what you'll see is on the left hand side, the precentral gyrus is motor and the blue, the aqua color, post central gyrus is sensory. But the thing that's really kind of interesting about that when you look at it, whoop, sorry about that. Let me see, I can go back. The one thing that's interesting is look at the body on the outside. You could see the face on the left, the tongue, the hand, the torso and the trunk, very small, then the hip and the feet and the toes take up a lot of space. And the same thing on the right hand side, you could see the face, the lips, the eyes, all very big, the hands, the feet, very big, um, but the torso and the trunk kind of small. So what this is trying to indicate and to show this homunculus is that the parts of the body that are highly sensitive um, in terms of sensory and motor, meaning if you think of the eyeball, the eyeball can move millimeters. If you think of your fingers, your fingers can move very, very slow and move very minimally. If you think of the lips and the tongue, they're so intricate, they're, they're highly sensitive, right? If you bring a cup of coffee or tea to your lips, you can feel heat as it's approaching you. Um, so the parts of the body that, that are the most sensitive and the parts of the body that have precision to them are going to take up the most brain space. But then when we look at the larger body parts, maybe like the quads, the quadriceps, and the glutes, not so much. The torso, not so much. But the hands and the feet and the face, yes. Even though the quadriceps are large, large muscles, and the hamstrings and the glutes are large, large muscles, they don't take up a lot of brain power, okay? So all the sensory input, a sends up and ends up at the postcentral gyrus, but all the motor output messages start at the precentral gyrus and exit and go out. There are some relays in the brain. So as the sensory input comes in, it does a send, and we'll talk about a few parts that are within the brain, the different parts of the brain. So you have some basic understanding like cerebrum and cerebellum and thalamus and diencephalon, um, limbic system, insula. We'll go through some of these frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, different parts of the brain and, and go over what their primary functions are and make it somewhat relevant uh, to healthcare. All right, so let me go back into the screen share. and get into that PowerPoint again. So when we look at the brain, this is a cross section. And here is the front or anterior, and here is the back or the posterior. And the largest part of the brain is called the cerebrum. Now the cerebrum, not to be confused with cerebellum, they're different. Cerebrum has the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, just like the bones that we learned of the skull. Now we have lobes of the brain that correlate 
to those bones. There was a frontal bone, there's a frontal lobe. There's a parietal bone, there's a parietal lobe. There's a temporal bone, there's a temporal lobe. There's an occipital bone, there's an occipital lobe of the brain. And each of those have very, very different functions. But those are part of the cerebrum. Cerebellum is known as the little brain, it's posterior. And now let's look here at this part. We'll start at the bottom and we'll work our way upward. So here is the spinal cord. And as we move up a little bit, here is the medulla, the medulla oblongata. Now the medulla oblongata descends, descends through the magnum foramen, right? It descends through that occiput bone, through the magnum foramen, and it descends into C1 and C2 vertebrae. So the C1 and C2 vertebrae are extremely important because it is protecting the medulla oblongata. And you'll see a lot of discrepancy in some of your anatomy books because they'll say that the medulla does not descend below the occiput. And I would agree that when I did all my human anatomy, and I looked at cadaver studies, it's correct. But that's because water dehydrates and bodies lose hydration when we die and the tissues ascend and shrink and move upward. So when we look at cadavers, the medulla, which when we're alive in living bodies, descends into C1, C2. When the person dies, it pulls superior, pulls upward above the occipital bone. But in functional MRIs, it clearly shows that medulla oblongata descends into the C1 and C2 vertebrae. Now, that's very, very important because within the medulla oblongata, there are many cranial nerve nuclei, right? We opened up today's lecture with what is a nucleus, then we did what is a ganglia, what is an uh, axon and what is a nerve. So in the medulla oblongata are nucleus of, or nuclei of cranial nerves. The cranial nerves that originate in the medulla oblongata are cranial nerves 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. There's 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and you should know them by Roman numeral. And I know that we talked about this very, very early on in the term when we talked about bones, and we went through the different foramen, like foramen ovale, foramen rotundum, foramen spinosum, uh, superior orbital fissure, inferior orbital fissure. We talked about a cribiform plate. We spoke about cranial nerves that travel through those foramen. So from the medulla oblongata are cranial nerves 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Now of those, the, probably the most important one is the 10th cranial nerve, and the 10th cranial nerve is the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is a very important parasympathetic nerve. Your parasympathetics are and sympathetics, those are the two opposing neural systems. They're part of the autonomic neural system or the ANS. The autonomic neural system has an accelerator and a brake, one that speeds things up and one that slows things down. And we are always in a sympathetic state, right? We're sympathetically driven. When a baby is born, the breathing is fast, the heart rate is fast, and as the brain starts to develop and the ne neurology starts to develop, parasympathetics kick in and acts as the brake to kind of slow things down. When you take your foot off the brake, you accelerate again, right? Even if your foot is not on the accelerator, the car is still moving. You have to engage the parasympathetic or the brake in order to slow it down for the most part. So the parasympathetic is called the craniosacral output, the craniosacral output or the craniosacral outflow. It's called craniosacral because there's a cranial division and a sacral division. The cranial division are four cranial nerves, cranial nerve three, seven, nine, 
and 10. Cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10. 3, 7, 9, and 10. 10, vagal nerve. The vagal nerve makes up 90% of the parasympathetic. It is tremendously important. And I'll show you a picture of the vagal nerve shortly and how important it is in all the different parts of the body that it goes to. But it goes to about 90% of the human body, which is why the word vag vagus comes from the word vagrant, like a vagrant person is a wanderer and it wanders to about 90% of the body. So cranial nerves 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, cranial nerve 8, well, again, we'll go through these cranial nerves in a picture and through the PowerPoint shortly, but cranial nerve 8 is the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve 9 is the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve 10 is the vagal nerve, cranial nerve 11 is the spinal accessory nerve, and cranial nerve 12 is the hypoglossal. And we'll go through uh, their functions in a little bit. So that's the medulla. And again, cranial nerve 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And it's protected by C1 and C2, which is why when babies are born, they're always checking an APGAR score because there's excessive pulling and traction and rotation on a baby's neck when they're being born. When there's excessive traction, pulling, and torquing on a baby's neck, it's likely to subluxate a C1 or C2 vertebra, compromising the neurological output, meaning it now it distorts the neurological frequency of motor output or sensory input. And now you have a heart that doesn't function properly, or lungs that don't function properly, or digestion that doesn't function properly, and a baby that can't hold down food because the sphincter along the stomach, that esophageal sphincter or pyloric sphincter, isn't working properly. And you have these babies that can't thrive and hold down food. A lot of that can come from traumatic birth syndrome. And again, the vagal nerve or the vagus nerve controls all of those things that I just described. So it's very likely that this autonomic imbalance, whether it be to digestion, heart, or lungs, is actually coming from subluxation or neurological compromise and interference from traumatic birth, creating a subluxation of the atlas, distorting the frequency of output or input at the medulla. So here's the medulla. As we ascend and look a little further upward, here's the pons. Pons means bridge. And if we go higher up, this section right here is called the midbrain. So from inferior to superior, it's the medulla, pons, and midbrain. These three parts here make up the brain stem. The brain stem is made up of the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. When we go higher up, we have a part of the brain called the diencephalon. Diencephalon means through the brain. Inside, through the brain, are two important parts, thalamus and hypothalamus. Thalamus and hypothalamus. The thalamus is, is the relay station for all of your sensory input, meaning as all the sensory data comes into your body and it ascends up and it wants to go to the post central gyrus where all the sensory output, all the sensory input ends up, it makes a relay first to the thalamus. And the thalamus is going to say, okay, you're going to go up here, you're going to go over there. It's kind of the relay that's going to help direct it to a specific part of the post-central gyrus, okay? Um, uh, so the thalamus is the relay for all the sensory input, except for the sense of smell. The thalamus does not deal with smell. That's your limbic system, okay? So those are the main parts of the brain. Cerebrum, cerebellum, don't confuse the two, medulla, pons, midbrain. And then through the center is the diencephalon, thalamus, and hypothalamus. The hypothalamus um, is a major connector to the autonomic neural system, the ANS, which is sympathetic and parasympathetic. The hypothalamus controls the autonomic neural system, and it also controls your thirst, your hunger, your sex drive, anger, a lot of that is hypothalamus. 
In fact, that's where many eating disorders can take place, up in the hypothalamus. Any questions uh, so far? Everyone's good? Let me move on to the... Uh, so the brain is one of the largest organs of the body. It's almost three pounds. And it deals with brain functions and sensations, your memories, your emotions, your decision-making, your behavior. In fact, here in the frontal lobe of the brain, in the frontal lobe of the cerebrum, that's your emotional center. That helps you, that's your motivation. Your motivation center, your behavior center, the center of the brain that deals with inhibiting certain behaviors where you know you shouldn't do something so you don't do it, right? In kids, their brains aren't really developed yet until they're about five years old. So when they're three, four, five, there's lots of, why did you do that? Didn't I, don't you know that that's wrong? Why'd you push your sister down the stairs? Didn't I tell you if you do that, you get in trouble? Yes, then why did you do it? I don't know, right? So it's all frontal lobe dysfunction. And when I say dysfunction, it's just not fully functioning when it's in kids. Now, this can um, exist in adults where adults make poor decisions, where we know that you shouldn't get into a car if you're under the influence of alcohol, but yet many people do. Now, that's a poor judgment call. Being able to say, I think I should call an Uber, this is going to result in a dangerous situation. Uh, when you can rationalize that, that's good frontal lobe. When you don't, that's a, that is dysfunction to the frontal lobe. When you're motivated enough to stay in school and you have a goal, an outcome, you want to become a nurse, you want to become a healthcare professional, a doctor, anything that requires thought and motivation. If you have a distorted frontal lobe, these are the people that live at home till they're 50 years old in their parents' basement playing Xbox for the rest of their life. No motivation, no drive, no ambition. That's frontal lobe imbalances. When the frontal lobe is functioning well, you can self-motivate, self-inspire, you can make good decisions, healthy decisions, contribute to society. When the frontal lobe is distorted, we see imbalances to that. Uh, a lot of ADD type of symptoms show up at the frontal lobe. Uh, the frontal lobe develops with movement. In fact, most of the brain develops with movement. Motion is what drives the brain. It's that input that comes into the brain. So if you're telling a child to sit still for six hours of the day in school, and the brain isn't being fed information about movement, this is when you start to see the leg shake, the knee goes up and down, or the person gets fidgety, and they start moving to try and stimulate the brain. It's not that it's poor behavior on the child, it's just, it's just innately they're trying to increase sensory input into the brain to let it develop. That's why going to parks is so healthy for young children, running, moving, any type of physical activity where the extremities and the parts of the body are moving sends input to the brain so it can develop properly. When there's no movement, think of what happens to your muscles. If there's no movement, muscles atrophy. Muscles are nothing other than an extension of your neural system. There's no other organ or part of the body that is as highly innervated as your skeletal muscles. It's constantly receiving input about tension, tone, movement, and it sends that information into the brain. If you're not moving, muscles atrophy. If you're not moving, brain and neurons start to atrophy. So children need to move. The brain loves movement. That's why kids love being on swings. It's movement. That's why adults like biking, it's linear acceleration. Rollerblading is linear acceleration. Jumping from an airplane, you know, and doing skydiving, that's all acceleration. The brain loves that type of movement. Running, speed walking, uh, swings, seesaws, skateboards. This is all ways of stimulating the brain so that it can develop. This is why it becomes so detrimental in senior assisted living homes when they're not moving. 
if we think about what's happening in our communities now with COVID, we see a large amount of this happening in our senior assisted living homes and many many people are dying i know firsthand because i have patients of mine that are nurses that work in these facilities and they reported the other day how many of these people have become victimized and have died sadly no movement if there's no movement no matter how well nourished the person is no matter how much vitamin c how much vitamin d how much elderberry how much zinc even if they throw hydroxyquinolone in there and they did all of these therapeutics, you still need muscles to pump, to pump fl uh, blood and lymphatics to get everything circulating. If they're lying in a bed all day and there's no movement or stimulation to neurology, I think the outcomes are, are looking morbid. It's just not looking good. And, and this is in general speaking we we don't even have to say covid we could just look at people in general and say if you look at a body of water and if a body of water is stagnant that's where you start to see all this growth and bacterias and viruses start to form in fungi and algae along the water but if you have constant movement of that water then things don't get to accumulate movement is life life is motion okay so um what else can I tell you about? Uh, so sensations, memory, emotions, all this came up because of decision-making, right? Road rage. A person that has a dysfunctional front lobe may, may, uh, may be cut off by someone accidentally. Maybe someone was driving and someone was in their blind spot and they accidentally cut someone off. They raise their hand and say, sorry, I didn't see you. And that person with the distorted frontal lobe follows them for 10 miles and they have a gun in the car or they have a, they have a hammer and they just want to get revenge on that person. Again, distorted frontal lobe. So here, let's see if we can move this. Give me a second to go back here. I don't want this being in the way. Let me see if I can minimize this. There we go. All right, so here, let me go back. Here is the central sulcus. Now the key to looking at the brain and being able to differentiate front from back, we already know this is the lateral view but now we have to figure out anterior from posterior. The cerebellum at the bottom, the cerebellum is always posterior. Um, if we look, let me come off screen share for a second. If we look here, we can see the cerebellum is always posterior. Okay, that's the cerebellum. This is the cerebrum. Then we have the medulla, pons, and midbrain, okay? Okay, let's go back into the screen share. So here's the central sulcus. The reason why I wanted you to know cerebellum for posterior is once you find that central sulcus, you'll see it's the only groove that goes all the way down, right to that temporal lobe. Here's the temporal lobe. Here's the frontal lobe. Here's the occipital lobe. And then right here, the central sulcus, if you look at any of these other grooves, like this groove here, it comes to an end. This groove is blocked. This one is the only one that can make it all the way from the longitudinal fissure, which I'll show you in a second, that, that's kind of in alignment with the sagittal suture. So the central sulcus is perpendicular to that sulc, to the um, longitudinal fissure or that sagittal suture. It's horizontal and goes all the way down right to the temporal lobe. So in front of the central sulcus is the pre, meaning before, pre-central gyrus, and behind it is the post or after post-central gyrus. Now remember, pre-central gyrus is where all of your motor output begins. Post-central gyrus is where all, your, all of your sensory or ascending input um, ends up. 
as it ascends, it ends up here. And this is where you saw that picture of the homunculus. So frontal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, and parietal. The frontal lobe, the precentral gyrus, which is all motor, the precentral gyrus is part of the frontal lobe, whereas the postcentral gyrus is part of the parietal lobe. Parietal lobe has a lot to do with your sensation uh, and your ability to interpret information that's sensory. So I've had patients that have said to me, hey doc, look at my left ankle compared to my right. My left ankle looks like it's bigger in diameter than my right. And I look at it and I go, looks good to me. Um, and I'll say, no, it's fine. I'll go, no, 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 take a look, doc. Really, it, it looks, it looks like it's, the girth of it is just, it's much fatter than the other one. So it's either my distortion, my parietal lobe is off and things look the same, or it's their parietal lobe is distorted and things look off balance to them. So I'll take a tape measure and I'll go around the medial and lateral malleolus and I'll get a measurement and I'll say, what does that read? And they may say nine inches and I'll say, okay, let's put it on the right one. And I put it on their right leg around the medial lateral malleolus, just a little bit above and I'll wrap it around for them. And I'll say, okay, what does that read? And they'll say nine inches. And then I use the Socratic method quite a bit. So I'll say, well, if the left one is nine inches and the right one is nine inches, well, what does that mean? And then there's this hesitation. Well, I guess, they're the same thickness. Yes, that it is the same thickness. But 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 look, doc. But look, look. It's bigger, right? So in their brain, in their reality, uh, things appear the way they appear. And no matter what, if you can show them something objectively, they'll, in their educated brain, understand it. But they still won't see it that way. So there's an imbalance to the parietal lobe. And there are ways of rehabilitating someone neurologically. There are ways of stimulating the frontal lobe to bring it to balance. There's ways of stimulating the parietal lobe to bring it balance. And there's ways of stimulating it using a hemispheritic model, meaning only stimulating the left hemisphere or only stimulating the right hemisphere. As we know, that input or sensory input to their right part of the body, let's say my right fingers, if I'm stimulating them, then the input from my right hand goes up to my, to my uh, right cerebellum, but crosses over to the left cerebrum. So the brains, different parts of the brain are crisscrossing and communicating with each other on opposite sides of the body. So I could use therapies whether it be light, sound, movement, eye movement, use adjustments and manipulation of the body as an input coming into one side of the body to stimulate the brain. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next one. So again, this is just another picture showing the main parts of the brain. Uh, again, you can see on the left, the cerebrum, the diencephalon that's made of the thalamus and the hypothalamus, cerebellum, the brainstem, which has the medulla, pons, and midbrain. If you look on the picture, here's the cerebellum, here is the medulla, pons, midbrain, cerebrum. And again, the cerebrum has the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobes. Okay, this is an important picture um, because what I want you to see here is in the middle, you can see these chambers right in the center. And these chambers are called ventricles. And there's a liquid that flows in these ventricles called CSF. CSF stands for cerebral spinal fluid. Cerebral spinal fluid flows in these ventricles, and there's four ventricles, ventricles one, two, three, and four. The lateral ventricles here, here, and here represent two of them. So this is ventricle one, and this is ventricle two, and it doesn't matter if it's the right or left, left or right, they're just two ventricles. They are considered the lateral ventricles. I know. 
Can you turn your microphone off, please? No, ma, sigue lento. Natalia, please turn off your microphone. Okay. So we have the ventricles here, which have cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid is made here in the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus is lined with cells called ependymal cells. You'll learn about them a little bit more in lecture. The ependymal cells is a type of neuroglial cell. In the neural system, there's the neuron and there are neuroglial cells. The neuron is the only cell that's electrically excitable. And then you have different types of neuroglial cells like Schwann cells, ependymal cells, oligodendrocytes, microglial cells. But the one neuroglial cell or neuroglial cell that creates CSF is called the ependymal cell and it lines the choroid plexus. Okay, so lateral ventricles one and two, CSF is flowing here. Then it moves into the third ventricle. And from the third ventricle, it goes through the cerebral aqueduct down into the fourth ventricle. And from the fourth ventricle, it can go down through this median aperture and goes down all the way down into the spinal cord, all the way down to the bottom where the sacrum is, and then it pumps it back up and it circulates the CSF. Some doctors, like a lot of osteopaths, call it the cranio sacral pump. The craniosacral pump is the pumping mechanism of CSF deep within the uh, brain and spinal cord. So lateral ventricles one and two, then and it leaves the lateral ventricles and goes into the third ventricle. And it does that by going through this right here, which is called the foramen of Monroe. This is called the foramen of Monroe. So from lateral ventricles one and two, it goes through the foramen of Monroe into the third ventricle. From the third ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct. Then from the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. And from the fourth ventricle, it has two options. It goes through the median aperture or the lateral aperture. Uh, the same three layers that protect your spinal cord also protect your brain. They're called meninges, the dura mater, arachnoid, and pia mater. The pia mater is the layer that's most internal, and the dura mater is the most external layer that's closest to the bone. And the arachnoid is the middle layer. There is a layer that we'll show you that's called the subarachnoid space. If you see it here, the subarachnoid space, that's where the CSF flows. The CSF flows and bathes the brain in that subarachnoid space. Blood flow to the brain. Uh, you'll learn a little bit more about it in uh, Anatomy 2, but there is a circulation, blood circulation and glucose that circulates blood, oxygen, and glucose come up into the brain through circulation, and the blood that comes up there has to ascend and move up, and it has two ways of getting up there. One is the vertebral artery that goes right through the transverse foramen, right? Here's the transverse processes and there's holes in there called the transverse foramen. So you see that arch of the aorta, which is here, there's the vertebral artery that comes up, but then there's also the carotid artery. It's called a common carotid artery. And anything that has the word common will divide into an internal and external something. So in this case, we have the external carotid and we have the internal carotid. The external stays external, it feeds the muscles of the face, but the internal carotid goes into the brain and feeds it blood, oxygen, and glucose. 
you will learn it as the circle of Willis uh, next term, the circle of Willis. And you'll have to learn the blood supply in a little bit more detail, but this is just some superficial information. Uh, the brain utilizes 20% of the blood oxygen level and any interruption of oxygen supply is gonna create neuron damage to the brain. Uh, we call it either a stroke or a TIA or brain attack. Whenever there's a blockage or decrease of blood flow, that means you're decreasing glucose to the brain and decreasing oxygen to the brain. And the brain needs both of those to function. So if you have a blood clot, you're not gonna get oxygen, blood, or glucose to the brain, or if you have a hemorrhage of a blood vessel, then the same thing happens. Dr. Linder? Yes. Um, I have a question. So like, you know how if you have a heart attack, they'll usually shock you, and many times you can come back to life? Yeah. Without oxygen, why can't they do the same thing with the brain? Well, the reason why they shock the heart is to get the heart pumping, right? It's a muscle. So they're doing it to get the pumping mechanism of blood going to the body again. However, the body may come back to life, but if the person's been dead or the heart hasn't been beating for a period of time, the, the neurons of the brain can only survive for a few minutes at best without oxygen. Like three and minutes, right? Yeah, some say three, some say four, I guess, you know, maybe between three and five minutes uh, for the most part. Um, if those uh, dendrites die and those neurons die, they're dead. There's no way of resuscitating them. But there's ways of rehabilitating the person. So there are people who have had strokes on their right side of their brain and have become hemiparetic or paralytic on the left side of their body. And through neuromuscular exercises and rehab, they have gained that function back. Now they've only gained that function back, not because they brought the dead neurons in their brain back to life, their body actually sprouted new ones. So your brain can sprout new dendrites and new axons. We know this because you can be an adult um, and have never thrown a basketball in a basket before. And the first time you do it, you have no coordination or you may not be able to throw a Frisbee well, or catch a baseball, or throw a baseball, or ski. And the first time you do any of those, your coordination is off and you may go, oh, I suck, I'm horrible, I'm no good. And then by doing it over and over a little bit each day and you give a little bit of a break and then you pick it up and you do it again and give it a little break and then all of a sudden, in a few weeks, you become a natural at it. So that's called neuromuscular education and neuromuscular re-education where your brain can be retaught. That's the beauty of it. It's called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity. Does that answer your question? Okay. Here is the circle of Willis. It actually makes a circle. You can see here and here are the vertebral arteries and then they come upward, and here's the carotids, and they formulate this little circle, and off of it are many branches that bring blood glucose and oxygen to the brain. So if there's a clot, let's say here, to this vertebral artery, you can still get blood coming up this one and can still make it up. But if you have, let's say, a clot that happens, let's say here, now this is the left hemisphere of the body. This is where the speech center is. So if there's a clot that's affecting the left hemisphere, specifically Broca's area of the brain, and that's the motor speech center of the brain, this is why people slur their words or their speech becomes impaired. And then the opposite side of the body becomes dysfunctional. Okay, I'm gonna skip through. Ah, here's a one that I wanted to show you, the CSF, because this is the side of the brain, a lateral view or a 3D view of it. And you can see the ventricles. This is how cerebral spinal fluid flows looking deep into the center of the brain. So this is a lateral view, but you can see they're kind of showing it three dimensional. So you can actually see the left and the right lateral ventricles a little bit. 
here's the left one and then here's the right one closer to us. So these are the two ventricles. And then we have fluid, the CSF is gonna flow down right through here to get into the third ventricle. It's gonna go through the interventricular foramen of Monroe, right there. Now it goes into the third ventricle and to go from the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle down at the bottom, it's gotta go through the cerebral aqueduct or cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia. From here, now it goes right down into the fourth ventricle. After the fourth ventricle, it can exit through the median aperture or the lateral aperture. And that fluid is going to bathe the brain and the spinal cord in that subarachnoid space. There'll be a model that I can show you, and there's a PDF of just this. And you should know the lateral ventricles, third ventricle, fourth ventricle. You should know the interventricular foramen of Monroe and the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia, okay? And the fourth ventricle and median lateral aperture. Okay, I'm gonna go through some of this. There's another picture of it showing the two lateral ventricles. Here's the interventricular foramen of Monroe third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, and here is the fourth ventricle right here. So on the bottom it says the choroid plexus uh, is lined with ependymal cells and that's what's going to create the cerebral spinal fluid. This is the same thing, but looking at the brain, not from a lateral perspective, but looking at it from the uh, anterior, Right, here's the cerebellum, this is posterior, this is the frontal lobes, and here is the center, the longitudinal fissure of the brain. So you can see the lateral ventricles in both hemispheres of the brain. And then you can see the cerebral aqueduct. And then we can see the fourth ventricle. And then the median aperture, so you can see the CSF flowing down through the central canal of the spinal cord. And then here's the lateral aperture to help bring it back around into the brain. Okay, the brain stem we said is made of the medulla, the pons and the midbrain. And in the brain stem or in the medulla, we said it's an extremely important part. This is where you have ascending and descending tracks because remember, any bit of information, whether it be input that's coming from your feet, like walking at the beach and you can feel that the sand is, is hot, that information has to go up. Uh, if you are having lower back pain, even if it's in the lumbars, that information has to ascend and go up and go through the medulla in order to get to the postcentral gyrus. Okay, so, and the descending tracks, remember there's the word tracks. Tracks are just a group of axons within the CNS, a group of tracks within the CNS. So you'll hear terms like lateral corticospinal tract, uh, anterior corticospinal tract, rubrospinal tract, spinocerebellar, tract. And the names of the tracks will help you determine whether it's sensory or motor. So if we hear of a tract that's called the corticospinal, cortico means cortex, spinal from spine, it's going from the cortex down into the spine. So if it's going from above down, that's a descending tract or a motor tract. If it's called the spino cerebellar tract, now it's going from the spine up into the cerebellum, that's an ascending or a sensory tract. So the name of the tract tells you the direction that it's flowing. Spinal cerebellar going up. Corticospinal going down. Uh, in the medulla, we have the nuclei of five cranial nerves. Which ones? Cranial nerve 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. In the medulla is the control center for the cardiovascular and the respiratory center. 
if you think back to Christopher Reeve or Superman when he had his accident, uh, that his horsing accident, um, he fractured his dents of C2. He fractured the odontoid process and severed parts of the medulla. So his heart and his lungs never quite worked the same on its own. He needed assistance to regulate that. In the medulla, you could see right here, you see this tract and this tract here, you see how they crisscross? It's called the decussation. So here and here, it's this decussation that helps explain why the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and why information, that sensory that's coming in to the right side of the body crosses over to the left brain and information from the left side of the body crosses over and goes to the right brain. It's because of this decussation. It's the left cerebral cortex controlling the muscles on the right, that decussation. The decussation is made up of the corticospinal tracts, the corticospinal tracts crisscross at the level of the medulla. All right, uh, so let's go through these cranial nerves. In terms of the medulla, we have the 12th cranial nerve is the hypoglossal, and the hypoglossal controls speech. Uh, it controls the tongue that helps you, the motor part of speech. When I say speech, the speech center is really found in the left hemisphere of the brain, but the tongue is involved with the motor component of helping you speak, but also helping you swallow. So the 12th cranial nerve is motor to the tongue. When there's an injury, when someone sticks out their tongue, it will deviate to the injured side. And that's why the tongue is a great way of determining if there's a stroke and decreased oxygen into the medulla. We'll say, open your mouth, say, ah, stick out your tongue. When we say, ah, we're looking at the uvula and seeing if there's any devi deviation of the uvula as well. Sticking out the tongue is a way of assessing the 12th cranial nerve. Um, when we test cranial nerves, we're doing it because we want to evaluate the center of the brain of which these cranial nerves originate. So if I think someone had damage to the medulla, I'm going to check cranial nerves 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. If I think they had damage to the pons, then I'm going to check cranial nerves five, six, and seven. If I think they had damage to the midbrain, I'm going to check cranial nerves three and four. If I think they had damage to the cerebrum, I can use cranial nerves one and two. Okay, cranial nerve 11 is called the spinal accessory nerve. Now this uh, cranial nerve primarily controls the skeletal muscles of the throat, and the SCM and the trapezius. So your ability to turn your head, to have the SCM, the sternocleidomastoid, and to elevate your scapula for the upper trapezius is controlled by the spinal accessory nerve, cranial nerve 11. Again, you have to know them by Roman numeral. So X is 10, one in front of it is 11. Here's my favorite cranial nerve of all time. It is the vagal nerve. It's because I have as a doctor of chiropractic, direct influence over this cranial nerve, which is why you hear so many people that may say, uh, I saw a chiropractor and uh, he or she helped me with my digestive problems, or I saw a chiropractor and he or she was able to help regulate my blood pressure, or I saw a chiropractor and he or she helped me with my asthma, right? So, people will go, well, what the heck does that have to do? I thought chiropractors dealt with neck pain and back pain. Yes, to a certain degree, those are very easy things to fix. But when you look at the neurological influence of what an adjustment does, when you look at the C1 area where the medulla is, this is where the 10th cranial nerve nuclei is. So by stimulating that and bringing and balancing out the tone, it controls the cardiac muscle and the smooth muscle of the viscera. 
and it controls 90% of the sympathetic. So here, if you look at that vagal nerve, and over the years, I think I've helped just 25 years in practice, we've helped thousands of people with lung issues and cardiac issues and digestive problems and blood sugar imbalances and detoxification issues and kidney issues and digestive issues, not because not because I treated those conditions, not by any means, uh, but we can use these organs as a way of measuring outcome. So if someone's having a lung issue and I check them using spirometry or someone's having blood pressure issues and I take their blood pressure prior to treatment and their blood pressure is too high, and the reason for their high blood pressure or their lung imbalance or their digestive issues or their blood sugar issues or their constipation is due to neurological compromise, then by making an adjustment and by treating them, affecting the vagal nerve, bringing the autonomic neural system back to balance, the outcome measurement is now function. Well, let's recheck their blood pressure. Well, let's recheck their blood sugar. Well, let's recheck spirometry. Let's recheck the values in blood to determine how well they're detoxifying. Let's look at how well they're moving their bowels. So the way you assess structure is by looking and evaluating function. That's the beauty of the, the vagal nerve. Okay, glossopharyngeal, cranial nerve nine. Cranial nerve nine deals with the uh, sense of bitter to the posterior one-third of the tongue. So the posterior one-third of the tongue is bitter, and it also deals with the parotid gland, which is on the side of the uh, jaw. Remember where the masseter muscle is? So right near the masseter muscle, near the mandible, is the parotid gland. That's controlled by cranial nerve nine, the glossopharyngeal. I'll jump ahead a second, and we'll go to it again, but there's other tastes like sweet, sour, and salty. And there's other salivary glands, the sublingual and submandibular. That's controlled by cranial nerve seven. So seven has a lot of the S's. Seven, sweet, sour, salty, seven. Sweet, sour, salty, seven. So the, t the sense of sweet, sour, and salty is cranial nerve seven, and that's the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Whereas the parotid gland is the posterior one third of the tongue for bitter. Cranial nerve nine lifts the throat during swallowing. This is one of the things that we look at neurologically. When I'm assessing a patient, I'll shine a light in the mouth. I'll say, ah, I want to make sure the uvula is moving up right in the center. That's the little punching bag behind the throat. Otherwise, if there's a deviation, you won't see the, um, you will not see the uvula rise centrally, it may deviate to one side or the other with strokes, very commonly seen. Vestibular cochlear nerve. Okay, when we look at the name of the nerve, vestibular cochlear, there's, it used to be called the acoustic nerve. Acoustic just means sound. And the vestibular cochlear nerve, I'm going to come out of my screen share for a second. Okay, I'm gonna come out of my screen share for a second and show you this. So here's the ear, and here's the petrous portion of the temporal bone. When I take that off and we look inside, if I take this out, this here, This, these are the canals, they're called vestibular canals, and it looks like it's an X, Y, and Z axis. And then here is the cochlear, it looks like a snail. And on the other side is the nerve that goes to it. One's going to the cochlear, one's going to the vestibule. So we call it the vestibular cochlear nerve. The cochlear deals with hearing, the vestibular has these canals. It has an anterior canal, a posterior canal, 
and a lateral canal. It deals with movement of the head. There's fluid that circulates in these canals, like a carpenter level. If I wanna look at one of these frames behind me and see if it's level, I put a carpenter level on it, and if it's tilted, the air bubble moves up and down, right? Same thing happens here. So when I move my head to the right or forward, the air bubble moves behind. When I move up, the air bubble moves forward all in these canals. These, in these vestibular canals, there are these little hairs that send input into the vestibular nerve. Same thing with sound waves. The sound waves come into the ear and it will rattle all the different parts of the ear, specifically when sound waves come in, it hits the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane vibrates and the vibration is gonna move the malus, incus, and stapes. And then that vibration is going to, the vibration of the bones gets transferred into a vibrational frequency into the cochlear, into the snail-like structure. And then within the snail is fluid as well. And that fluid is gonna stimulate other hairs. And then it hits the cochlear nerve. So you have the vestibular cochlear nerve. Vestibular is for balance and equilibrium. The cochlear portion is for hearing. When people get cochlear implants, it helps them with their hearing. When people get vertigo or dizziness that comes from the inner ear, you have people, children, babies that are born and they're born with a vacuum extraction or a forceps delivery. And when the forceps goes around the skull and they like tongues and they pull, it distorts the temporal lobe. When you have distortion of the temporal lobe, you can influence what's happening in here, the petrous portion of the temporal lobe. If you distort the bone, and you distort the structure of the temporal bone, you distort the structure of the vestibular canals. When you distort the structure of the vestibular canals, remember there's output. There's output that goes from the vestibular canals to the muscles around your spine. So that if I'm leaning this way, rather than have me fall over, the muscles on this side, because of my ear, contract and pull me back to balance. If I'm leaning this way or I slip and fall, the other side, vestibular canal, sends messages or output to my paraspinal muscles and pulls me into balance this way. What is the significance of this? Because when you have distorted output from the vestibular canals going to the paraspinal muscles, you get scoliosis. And this is what they call idiopathic scoliosis. They don't know where it's coming from. And nothing seems to fix it. Even what I do as a chiropractor may not be able to fix it from a traditional standpoint because the outcome is what we're looking at. We're looking at a scoliosis, like a letter S. And I can try and change that by adjusting the spine in an opposite direction. But if the cause is in the inner ear, this is when they go for surgery and they get these Harrington rods put in there. And over time, the Harrington rods even break. Because if a blade of grass can go through asphalt, look how soft a blade of grass is and it can break through concrete. You're telling me that Harrington rods are gonna straighten out a spine? No chance. Mm -mm. So the correction has to be deep here within the ear. And that's this is some pretty cutting edge information. It's pretty hot off the press, probably within the last three or four years is what we're discovering this information. So um, again, some of this can be recalibrated by working primarily with balance centers within the brain and the ear and how they work together. Okay, let me go back into my screen share. All right, so this was the vestibulocochlear nerve. So now we have an understanding of the cochlear dealing with hearing. If there's damage to it, you'll go deaf, or there are some drugs on the market that can damage the cochlear nerve 
causing tinnitus or ringing in the ear. You have to be really, really careful if you look at aspirin or the side effect to aspirin, it's tinnitus. So a lot of people use uh, baby aspirins to try and thin their blood and they get ringing in the ears or tinnitus as a result of that. Whenever taking medication, always look to see if they're ototoxic, meaning they can affect the ear because if you get this tinnitus, it's very, it becomes a real major problem for people or ototoxic can create in vertigo. So most vertigos, if they're structural, uh, we can fix them. Uh, easy to fix if the problem is within the vestibular canal. If the problem is not in the vestibular canal and it's not structural, then those become very, very difficult. So the ones that I can fix are the vertigos that are called benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Benign paroxysmal positional vertigo sound like this. The, they come to me, they come to you, they come to the nurse, they come to the doctor and they say, I have such dizziness, the whole world is spinning. Okay, when does it happen? I don't know. Does it happen when you turn over in bed? Yes, but it only happens when I turn in this direction. It only happens when I move my head this way. So those are predictable. Those are positional, benign, paroxysmal, positional vertigo. Those are fixable. When it happens sporadically and you can't predict it, then those are chemically induced. They're very, very difficult to manage. Uh, but if they're because a crystal is dislodged in the semicircular canals, then it's like playing with one of those mazes when you were a little kid, those cheap mazes that were like 50 cents from the, these festivals where it has the little metal BB in the middle and you have to move the maze and tilt it left and right to get the ball in the hole through the maze. That's what it ends up being like in terms of treatment. Moving the head in very specific positions to get the crystal that's dislodged back into the right part of the ear that it belongs in. So vertigo is this feeling of spinning or rotation and ataxia is when they have the lack of coordination. When someone is drunk and they can't walk with their feet close together and their feet are wide apart, we call that an ataxic gait. If there's problems with the cerebellum, cerebellum, not cerebrum, but cerebellum, that deals with balance and coordination, they walk with a wide-based gait. Here's a great picture of the vestibulocochlear nerve. Again, here's the semicircular canals. Here's the cochlear. So here is the vestibular branch. Here's the cochlear branch. Together, vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve eight. So sound waves here come in, they hit the tympanic membrane. And these smallest bones in the body, the malus, the incus, and the stapes, these vibrate and it sends this vibration here and there's fluid in here and little hairs and the vibration of that fluid gets transferred into that nerve. The frequency of that nerve comes in, goes into the brain, all the way into the temporal lobe of the brain and allows us to hear. Okay, the pons. So we did the medulla, here's the pons. And the pons controls, uh, like the medulla, it's involved with breathing. Um, it controls the rate and rhythm, uh, almost like the pause between your inspiration and expiration. And there's two cranial nerves, that nuclei that are found in the pons, and it's, uh, sorry, it's five, six, and seven and actually half of eight, but primarily five, six, and seven. So let's take a look at cranial nerve seven, called a facial nerve. Cranial nerve seven is sensory and motor. The sensory, remember I said before, sweet, sour, salty seven, sweet, sour, salty seven. And the motor part, the motor part deals with the muscles of facial expression. So the frontalis muscle, the temporalis, anything that can move your facial muscles is the motor part. But it also deals with salivation, not the parotid gland. Parotid gland was cranial nerve nine, but the submandibular and sublingual glands, that's seven. 
when you have damaged the cranial nerve seven, you get what's called Bell's palsy, where half the face becomes paralyzed. Bell's palsy. Abducens. Look at the word abducens right here. You can see the beginning of the word is ABD for abduct, abduct. So it takes the eye and moves it laterally. So if you were to cover your left eye and your right eye moves to the right or moves away from the nose, that's the lateral rectus muscle or the abducens nerve. The abducens goes to cranial nerve six. I'm going to do a different type of screen share for a second because I want to show you something. Um, I want to get the whiteboard here for a sec. I'm going to try and do this. So let's say here's an eye, here's an eye, nose, mouth. So the eye can move this way laterally, it can move up and out, it can move down and out, and it can move in. Okay, that's if we're looking at, let's say, this eye here. So when this, when the left eye, and this is the right eye, or an anatomical position, when the left eye moves to the left in this direction, that's the lateral rectus muscle. When the left eye moves in, it's the medial rectus muscle. When the eye moves up and out, it's the superior rectus muscle. When the eye moves down and out, it's the inferior rectus muscle. Okay, and now there's two other actions left, which is up and in, or down and in. These are called obliques, and they're opposites. So if it's moving up and in, up and in is the inferior oblique. Down and in is the superior oblique. Okay, when we look at the eye model, you'll see all of these six muscles. So you have the lateral rectus moves the eye laterally, medial rectus moves it medially, superior rectus up and out, inferior rectus down and out. Inferior oblique moves the eye up and in, and superior oblique moves the eye down and in. Now, the reason why I wanted you to, to see this is there's an equation called Lindner's chemical equation called SO4, LR6, all over three. What does this mean? This means that the lateral rectus muscle is innervated by cranial nerve six, we just learned that, that's called the abducens. So this one here, lateral rectus, is the abducens, and remember, it moves the eye away from the nose. That's abduction. The superior oblique muscle, which is this one here, that's gonna be cranial nerve four, called the trochlear nerve. We haven't done that yet. All over three means all the other muscles left over, our cranial nerve number three, oculomotor, okay? So what ends up happening, again, most of the time from birth trauma, you'll see that there are some people that are born with a deviated eye. So when there is damage and there's decreased nerve output to these muscles, you'll get abnormal muscle tone where maybe the lateral, lateral rectus muscle overfires because the medial rectus isn't getting enough antagonistic neurological output, so the eye wanders outward. Or you'll get an eye that pulls in because the abducens nerve on one eye isn't getting enough output, and because the medial rectus, which is innervated by cranial nerve three, gets a lot of neurological output going to it with not enough antagonistic output to lateral rectus, the eye deviates in. Okay, a lot of this can come from uh, birth trauma as well. Okay, let me stop the share here. How are you guys doing so far? Good? Learning something? Good? Okay, um, let's go back into the screen share.
All right, so there's the abducens. Trigeminal, great nerve. Trigeminal. Uh, so trigeminal means three. And if you look here, you'll see that the trigeminal has three branches. One, two, three. It has an ophthalmic branch going to the eye. It has a mandib uh, maxillary branch going to the maxilla. And then it has a mandibular branch going to the mandible. When someone has a virus that attacks here, you can get lightning shooting pain to half the side of the face. It's called trigeminal neuralgia trigeminal neuralgia. Anytime you hear algia, it means pain. Neuralgia, nerve pain. Myalgia, muscle pain. Arthralgia, joint pain. So trigeminal neuralgia is when they get this facial pain. I'm gonna go out of screen share for a second because years ago I went to, I think I shared this with you, to a new dentist in my area. And whenever you have to fill a cavity, they give you Novocaine, they have to hit the trigeminal nerve. So when they hit the trigeminal nerve, half your face goes numb, including half the tongue, which is why you can't feel half your tongue or half your face, and they can drill in any tooth and you don't have any sensation of it. When she gave me the Novocaine, she actually hit the nerve, and I got lightning pain to my face, and it was the most unbearable pain I've ever felt. And they consider this to be suicidal pain. The pain is knife-like, lancinating, shooting pain. And when people have trigeminal neuralgia, it's the most painful neurological condition on the planet. So I experienced it for a moment in time. She said, oh my gosh, I'm so, so I broke into a sweat. My nails dug into the chair of the dental office. And she said, I'm so sorry. I hit the nerve. Let me try again. She went second time, hit it a second time. And then I was like, Phew out the door so fast. It was the most painful experience, but it certainly made me more empathetic towards people when they came in with this condition. I would talk to them and they would just do this out of nowhere. They'd have this little tick and they would move their face because anything would set it off, whether it was wind, a particular movement, the way they spoke, and they would do this. So it's sometimes called tick de la rue, tick de la rue or trigeminal neuralgia. The trigeminal nerve, besides doing sensation to the face, to these three branches, it deals with the muscles of mastication. The muscles of mastication are the temporalis, the masseter, the internal and external pterygoids. Remember, tie muscles, T-I-M-E, temporalis, internal pterygoid, masseter, and external pterygoid. Your chewing muscles are controlled by the muscle, the uh, trigeminal nerve for muscles of mastication. Sensation, touch, pain, and temperature to half your face and to those three branches. Okay, midbrain. So we're moving a little bit higher up above the pons is the midbrain, which is here. So we did the medulla, we did the pons. So here is the midbrain. And in the midbrain back here is a very important area called the corpora quadrigemina. Corpora quadrigemina. It means the body of four. Let me see if I can get out of my screen share for a second. So I'm going to take off the cerebellum. I'm going to rotate this to the back and right here, deep inside, you can see way up here, one, two, three, four, corpora quadrigemina, body of four. Let's see if I can show that a little bit better. There we go. The body of four. You have the superior colliculi, which are the two higher up ones, superior colliculi, and two inferior colliculi. Those are part of the midbrain. The superior colliculi helps your eyes move. The um, inferior colliculi 
involves sound. So like if I heard a lot loud sound there, my whole head would turn to the direction of the sound. That's what the inferior colliculi is needed for. The superior colliculi helps your eyes to track as you're reading your paper. Okay. All right, let's go back to my screen share. The other, uh, besides this, besides here, the superior and inferior colliculi, the corpora quadrigemina, uh, the superior deals with eye movement, the inferior colliculi deals with auditory movement, uh, resulting in head movement when you hear sound. The other structure is very important. It's called the substantia nigra. It means black substance right here and right here. Within this black substance, the substantia nigra, this is the part of the brain that deals with releasing dopamine, which helps control muscle activity. When people have Parkinson's disease, it's a dopamine issue. That neurotransmitter, the body doesn't release enough dopamine to control and coordinate muscle activity. So with Parkinson's, the problem tends to be here in the midbrain, the substantia nigra. So the other important, besides the black substance, the superior and inferior colliculi, because there's one, two, three, four, it's called corpora quadrigemina, body of four. Trochlear, cranial nerve four. This is the one I spoke about when we did the uh, SO4, LR6, all over three. The trochlear nerve deals with an eye muscle called the superior oblique muscle, which again moves the eye down and in. The rectuses move the body, move the eye in the direction. The obliques do the opposite. So the superior oblique moves the eye down and in. Inferior oblique moves the eye up and in. Oculomotor, cranial nerve number three. Uh, the oculomotor, by its name, motor, it moves the eye. The other thing that it does is it involves constriction of the pupil. Remember we spoke about parasympathetic cranial nerves three, seven, nine, and 10. Three is the oculomotor. It deals with constriction of the pupil and movement of the eye. Cranial nerve seven. Seven is the facial nerve for sweet, sour, salty seven. Deals with salivation. Nine to help us with eating, right? The swallowing, the muscles of the back of the throat for nine. And 10, visceral function. Heart, lungs, stomach, kidneys, spleen. All of that is cranial nerve 10. Um, parasympathetic is three, seven, nine, and 10. That's the cranial division. The, I forgot to mention the sacral division when I opened this up earlier, the sacral division is, is the sacrum segments S2, three, and four. S2, three, and four keep the feces off the floor. S2, three, and four keep the feces off the floor. So parasympathetic, cranio, sacral output, cranial division, cranial nerve three, seven, nine, and 10. Sacral division, S234. Sympathetics, the sympathetics, which I spoke about earlier, I never told you that it's called the thoracolumbar output. It's called the thoracolumbar output because it goes from T1 to L2. T1 to L2. Thoracolumbar output. Uh, cerebellum. The cerebellum, like the cerebrum, has two hemispheres, a left and right hemisphere, and it has this worm-like structure called verm, vermis, right in the center. When we think of cerebellum, its primary function is fine coordination. Like if I were to touch my finger to my nose, let me get out of screen share for a second. 
If I were to say, touch the pointer finger to the nose, pointer finger to the nose, but the eyes have to be closed. So if I do this, good. If I do this, good. What if I did this? Not good. If I did this, not good. So the cerebellum, when it's dysfunctional, you see stop, go, stop, go, stop, go, stop, go, stop, go movements. When it's smooth, the stop, go movements are completely gone and you have fine coordination, but the eyes have to be closed when you do that. Um, another way I test cerebellar function is I have them with their eyes closed, take 50 high steps. They march in place with their feet, with their eyes closed, and they should be able to march in place without moving. Many people, when I do that, all of a sudden they start this way, they're marching in place, and by the time I'm done, they're facing this way, and they're not even in the same location. Balance and coordination. So balance is being able to stand. If there's a cerebellum problem, they'll deviate to one side or the other. That's the cerebellum. That's why when you get pulled over by the police and they're checking to see if alcohol got into the cerebellum. So they do finger to nose and they'll have you walk heel to toe in a straight line. If there's no alcohol in the body and the cerebellum isn't being influenced or, or the function of it isn't being downregulated, you should be able to walk normally and you should have good coordination. Unless, of course, the person isn't drunk or under the influence, but there is a cerebellar disease, which is possible. Okay, in the cerebellum, there's two important parts to it from this view. Uh, so this view is half of it. We could see that there is white matter and gray matter. The white matter, which is in the inside, is the arbor vitae. The folia, like foliage of a leaf, the outer part is uh, considered to be gray matter. So gray matter is on the outside within the brain, not just the cerebellum, but even the cerebrum. Gray matter is on the outside and white matter would be like the veins of the leaf. What makes white matter white? Myelin, it's myelinated, fatty substance. That's why fat is so important in the diet and having good fats. So white matter is myelinated, gray matter is not myelinated. In the spinal cord, it's the exact opposite, meaning here in the brain, we have white matter on the inside, gray matter on the outside. In the spinal cord, it's just the opposite. In the spinal cord, we're gonna have white matter on the outside and gray matter on the inside. Okay, thalamus and hypothalamus. Let's take a look here. Uh, from the lateral view, here is the thalamus, and there's many, many nuclei of the thalamus. Below the thalamus, inferior to it, is the hypothalamus, and then below the hypothalamus is the pituitary. There's a very important connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And you will learn a whole lot about that connection in AMP2 when we cover the endocrine system. So in AMP1, the last system we talk about is neurology, but the very first system you talk about in AMP2 is the endocrine system. And they do work hand in hand together, primarily because of this hypothalamic pituitary connection. If you wanna know how your thyroid works, it's because of the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. If you wanna know how your adrenal gland works, it's because of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal connection. If you wanna know how the gonads work, it's the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. We have an axis and for every function of the body. Um, the pituitary has an anterior and a posterior pituitary called the adeno hypothesis or neurohypothesis. 
The adeno hypothesis is the anterior pituitary. The neuro hypothesis is the posterior pituitary. And each of those divisions secretes different hormones, which we won't get into for AMP1. Here is another view showing both hemispheres. Uh, you can see this bean-like structure here, and this bean-like structure is the thalamus. The thalamus is the relay station for all the sensory information that needs to ascend up and make it to the post-central gyrus. It deals with all the sensory input except for the sense of smell. These are just a bunch of different nuclei. You're not responsible, but you could just see how many nuclei there are within the thalamus. And then it's going to relay this information to different parts of the cerebrum. Here is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, remember, controls the ANS, the autonomic neural system. It controls rage, anger, thirst, hunger. But here, the hypothalamus, like the thalamus, has many different nuclei. Again, you're not held accountable for it, but I want you to know that there is a connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And please don't confuse pituitary with pineal. The pineal gland is back here. The pituitary is more anterior. There is a cranial nerve that gets very, very close to the pituitary called the optic nerve, cranial nerve two. And I will show you why the optic nerve could be an indicator of a pituitary tumor in just a few minutes. So the hypothalamus controls the autonomic neural system, the ANS. Uh, it makes hormones that control the anterior pituitary, same as the posterior pituitary. You're talking about rage, aggression, pain, pleasure, thirst, feeding, controls your body temperature and helps to regulate your sleep pattern. So the hypothalamus uh, is very important. They consider it to be the link or the key uh, or the connector between the neural system and the endocrine system. So here's the pineal gland. Uh, it's part of the epithalamus. So we did thalamus, hypothalamus. Now there's an epithalmic region and it's primarily made of the pineal gland. The pineal is a very, very small gland. It's like a pea. It secretes melatonin. Again, in a time like we're in right now, we're finding that there aren't many children and young children that are affected by COVID-19 because they have much higher melatonin levels than adults. Melatonin has extremely, extremely important antioxidant protective mechanisms that tends to decrease as we get older. That's why babies sleep so well <laughs> and adults, you know, got, we got to work a little bit harder at sleeping sometimes. Um, and it promotes sleepiness. That's the importance of melatonin. Also many receptors in the gastrointestinal tract for melatonin. Cerebrum. Okay, let's take a look. Here is the left hemisphere and right hemisphere. Here's the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe. Again, here's the frontal lobe from this view, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe. Let's take a look at some of the fissures that you should know. So I'm gonna bring in some highlighted lines to accentuate them. Here is the, right there, longitudinal fissure. So what I said earlier was that the longitudinal fissure and the central sulcus are perpendicular to each other. So there's the central sulcus. The importance of the central sulcus is that it separates the pre-central from the post-central gyrus. Pre-central is your primary motor strip. 
post-central is your primary sensory strip. That's where the homunculus lies, which is that funky image of the human body that has the big, long face, eyes, tongue, and lips, etc. <clears throat> Here is on the bottom, you can see the yellow again for the central sulcus, again, separating the pre central gyrus from the post central gyrus. The colored areas, frontal lobe, pre central gyrus, post central gyrus, again, this is motor. This is sensory, so the motor strip is part of the frontal lobe. The post-central gyrus is part of the parietal lobe. Occipital lobe, primary for vision, your visual center is behind there. Uh, for taste and hearing, that's the temporal lobe. Again, remember frontal lobe was dealing with, um, frontal lobe was primarily dealing with your ambition, your drive, your personality, your logical thinking, your higher executive order, your ability to inhibit and slow down. If you think of how fast a heart rate is when a baby's born, it's very quick. You think of how quick a baby is breathing, that's because the frontal lobe can't inhibit and slow it down. As the baby gets older, between four and five years of age, as the brain starts to develop fully, now you have a frontal lobe that can inhibit. Kids make better decisions as they get older. Okay. Uh, this is a great picture showing the connection between right and left hemispheres. This is called the corpus callosum. What's interesting about the corpus callosum is that it's really an extension of axons and white matter that connect both hemispheres. Women have a much stronger and better connection than men do between left and right hemispheres, which may be why women can multitask better than men. My wife can do so much. She could like drive a car, change a diaper, you know, do five things. Uh, if I'm driving and I get lost, radio has to be turned off and I really have to focus to get there. That's, you know, pre-navigation, of course. Um, basal ganglia. Okay, the only thing I really want you to know about the basal ganglia, um, there is some parts to it, like the amygdala. People that have amygdala issues, uh, they get angry very easily. Um, there's anger management issues. And again, this is also with the frontal lobe, but amygdala has a lot to do with some of those emotions. Um, the amygdala deals with, uh, where is the other area here? Um, Chordate, lenticular, tail. Uh, you can see the thalamus is very closely located to the basal ganglia. When I think of the basal ganglia, I'm thinking about larger controlled autonomic movements. Like when you're walking and there's natural arm swing, that's basal ganglia. Um, when you slip and fall and your arms fling out, your legs fling out in different directions to try and create balance, that's basal ganglia. Limbic system, you don't have to know all of the parts to the limbic system. The only one that I think is important that sometimes shows up, um, you'll see here the fornix right there. When the limbic system, the fornix and hippocampus, I think of all of these, those may be the important parts to it. The fornix, the hippocampus, and I also want you to see that the olfactory bulb links into the limbic system. Olfactory is from your first cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve. Remember I said all of the sensory input goes to the thalamus except for smell. Well, where does smell go? the smell goes into the limbic system. Your limbic system is your emotional brain. Uh, the stronger the emotion, the stronger the memory. So hippocampus is a place where a lot of memories are stored. The stronger the, the emotional portion, whether it be a sad movie, a happy movie, a good professor, a boring professor, a happy song, sad song, a cologne, any of perfume helps you to create a stronger memory. 
So limbic is your emotional brain. The stronger the emotion, it's going to increase your, effe your efficiency of that memory. Okay. You can see when they pull away and separate the temporal lobe from that parietal lobe, there's an area a little bit deeper called the insula. The insula. Here's your occipital lobe. That's your visual cortex. If someone slips and falls and hits the back of the head, they can go blind. Um, frontal lobe here, besides controlling motor movement, the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe are involved with eye movements. Your parietal lobe deals with pursuits. Pursuit is, is let me take off my screen share for a second. A pursuit is when, if I went like this and say, follow my thumb this way, having your eyes pursue my finger, that's parietal lobe function. If I were to say, stare at my nose, and I, I know you could see both of my thumbs. If I wiggle this thumb, I want your head still, and I just want your eyes looking at that thumb. And then when I say look back to my nose, come right back to the center. If I wiggle this one, your eyes and only your eyes go to that thumb. So that quick movement, like seeing something there and then your eyes don't pursue smoothly to get there. It's a quick movement. That's called a saccade, saccadic movements. Saccades come from the frontal lobe, pursuits come from the parietal lobe. It's important to have good parietal lobe function and good frontal lobe function for reading, especially parietal lobe, because you have to be able to pursue and track what you're reading, as well as the superior colliculus of the midbrain. You have to be able to, a lot of kids that don't like reading, it's not that they don't like it, it's just the wiring of the way the brain is, they have to be able to track beautifully. The ones that have difficulty with reading, also the ones that have difficulty with paying attention. So there's a lot of connections between paying attention. Your son or daughter just doesn't sit still in class and, you know, when they don't like to read, they're just staring out a window. Well, yeah, your, your, your son or daughter doesn't pay attention to me. Well, are you sitting in chair or are you walking around the room? I'm walking. All right. So that's a pursuit. That's being able to track properly. So looking out the window, staring at a, a tree that isn't really moving is a lot easier for the child than having eyes track or writing on a board, having that mechanism. So a lot of rehabilitation can kick in for that neuro, uh, neurological rehabilitation to help these children. Okay, here is that Broca's area I was telling you about. Broca's area deals with, uh, I'm sorry, where is it? Number 44. Here's Broca's area, which is the speech center. It's on the left side of the brain. Uh, this is your primary uh, motor area. So this is your motor portion, precentral. One, two, and three is your postcentral. Precentral gyrus, postcentral gyrus. 44 is the motor speech area. If we look at left and right side of the brain in general, left side of the brain, we're thinking mostly number, math, language, uh, rationale, reasoning. That's all left hemisphere of the brain. Right hemisphere is more artistically, engineered like music, art, spatial and pattern recognition, all these things we see on social media lately. How many triangles do you see in this shape? How many faces do you see? That's all right brain stuff. Being able to recognize uh, faces and emotional content, having people talk and not just speak robotically, but use facial recognition and have their eyes light up. That's all right brain stuff. When there's aphasia, 
to the left side of the, when there's aphasia, it means that there's damage to the left side of the body. This picture I like quite a bit. Um, it just shows, if you look, for example, on the left hemisphere of the brain, you see the right hand, and you look at the right hemisphere, you see the left hand, that just shows you the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. It also shows that vision comes in for, to the receptors of the eye, and you have receptors on the inside and outside of each eye. When you're, and if the nose is here, you have input that comes from the nasal field of view, it hits the lateral receptors. Information on the temporal field of view hits the nasal receptors. So when something is, you're seeing it on the left outside of the left eye, it crosses over to the opposite side of the brain to the occipital lobe and information that you're seeing on front of you on the nasal side of view hits the receptors on the lateral part of the eye, it goes to the same side of the brain. So you need both sides of the brain to see properly. And the corpus callosum in the middle, the connection between the two brains. Now remember I said the pituitary gland and the optic nerve gets very close to it, so here, in the two optic nerves and they crisscross right there called the optic chiasm. Now let's see if I can find that other picture I want to show you right here. So here is the pituitary gland and here is the two eyes and you could see the nerves part, some nerves stay on the same side of the brain whereas receptors on the inside of the eye cross over to the opposite side of the brain. When that pituitary gland enlarges, it can hit some of the nerve endings creating blindness to the eye. Some people go blind on the left side of one eye, the left side of both eyes, the inside of both eyes, the right side of both eyes, or a whole eye completely dependent on where that pituitary tumor, when it enlarges, which nerves it pushes up against. Okay, let me go back here. You guys are doing really good. We're almost done here. Uh, brain waves, um, EEG, electroencephalogram, there's alpha, beta, theta, and delta waves. So when they put these electrodes on the brain, they're getting these readings that could determine if you're a healthy resting adult, whether, you, whether you're taking a test and you're concentrating hard, whether you're taking a test and you're frustrated taking a test, you'll get more theta waves, or whether there's sleep deprivation and sleeping issues, you'll see more delta waves. Your optic nerve, again, for cranial nerve number one, um, involves, is part of your vision center. But again, the eyes don't really do the same. The eyes just have receptors that allow your brain to do the same. The visual input that comes in that hits the receptors before it gets to the occipital lobe, look, it hits the thalamus. See, it hits the lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus. The thalamus is the relay station for all sensory input. Um, sorry, that was uh, optic nerve, cranial nerve two. Cranial nerve one is the olfactory for sense of smell. Sense of smell, you have the odorant that comes in through the, uh, into the nose. You have the superior, middle, and inferior concha or turbinates that spin the air as you breathe it. The odorant hits the uh, membrane, the epithelial membrane, into the olfactory bulb, into the nerve, into the limbic system. This is why they say wash your hands carefully because it takes very little for a virus or bacteria to hit the mucous membrane and there's really only this thin layer of bone that separates the outer world from your neural system, from the brain. But the connection here is that olfactory nerve can make it in to the uh, cerebrum.
Uh, here's the development of the neural system. It starts off as this neural plate, then it folds, you get these neural folds, and eventually you get a nodal cord that becomes the spinal cord. Um, one of the interesting things is that it begins at around day 18 or the third week, and it's formed from ectoderm, which happens to be the same tissue that the digestive system kind of comes from, okay? So you have that brain-gut uh, connection. Okay, I'm going to, this is just review again. So I'm gonna get out of this and let's just get into some of the models. Um, Guys, Fatima asked in the group chat, she asked who creates, what creates double vision? What creates? Double vision. Uh, it's a combination of things. Um, part of it, part of it can come from the way the receptors can be normal. Let me just get into my, you can have receptors of the eyes being normal. The eyes can actually see information normal, but what happens if you lose the myelin? What happens if the optic nerve that's completely protected by myelin wears down? Common in women, that's called MS, multiple sclerosis. You get visual disturbances that show up like double vision the conduction of impulses from the receptor to the brain become distorted. So one of the things that we look at, especially if symptoms like that come from women between the ages of 35 and to 50, somewhere in there, any history of autoimmunity, uh, MRI of the brain is always usually the first thing, and then they assess the, the myelin sheath to make sure it's healthy and not breaking down. Good question. Okay. Everyone doing good? I know it's long. <laughs> you don't do this in class. Usually it's maybe an hour of this, right? So you're getting a little bit more. Um, let's take a look at some of the models and I'll show you what's there. Let's go into the screen share. Uh, let me open it up first, one second. Okay, let's close that out. anatomy of the brain. So there is a um, PDF that you'll find that has all of this information. So now some of these terms will sound familiar to you. Um, every elevation that we have of the brain is called a gyrus, right? But every depression is kind of a sulcus. Here is the right hemisphere, cerebral hemisphere, left cerebral hemisphere. The outer part of the brain is called the cortex, which is gray matter. And the inner part is white matter. White matter is myelinated, gray matter is not. Again, here's another picture of the brain. <laughs> Excuse me. Cortex. <laughs> Cortex is gray matter. The inside is white matter. Again, in the spinal cord, it's the opposite. In the spinal cord, white matter is on the outside, gray matter on the inside. Here's the longitudinal fissure. It separates both left and right cerebral hemisphere. This is part of the skull, the protected part of the brain. So this is part of the skull that's removed. And then inside we could see some veins. And uh, this one here running this way is called the superior sagittal sinus. Then there's this one called the inferior sagittal sinus. A little bit Lower on this side is the straight sinus, and all the way down on the bottom, transverse sinus. This is how oxygenated blood that's in the brain, when it dumps all its oxygen, it becomes deoxygenated. It's got to find its way back to the heart. 
So the heart can beat it to the lungs. So the lungs can pick up oxygen all over again. Uh, this membrane, this clear sheath is called the Falk's cerebri. The fissure between the occipital lobe and the cerebellum is the transverse fissure. So there's one transverse fissure here, another transverse fissure here. Again, this is the longitudinal fissure here. This is the cerebellum, right hemisphere, left hemisphere, with the vermis in between. This is the longitudinal fissure, and remember what runs perpendicular to it is the central sulcus. Once we find the central sulcus, now we have, if here's the cerebellum, posterior, post-central gyrus, pre-central gyrus. The lateral sulcus is what separates the temporal lobe from the parietal lobe. When you turn the brain upside down, uh, the longer nerve here, this is one of your cranial nerves, that's cranial nerve one, the olfactory nerve. And then here is the optic nerves, cranial nerve two, but where they crisscross, where they make the X, that is the optic chiasm. A chiasm is nothing more than a crisscross. That's why when the pituitary gland enlarges with a tumor, it can push up against any of those tracks, any of those uh, optic tracks in the optic chiasm, creating blindness. Frontal lobe of the brain, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe. Precentral gyrus, part of the frontal lobe. And then the blue is the postcentral gyrus, part of the parietal lobe. Here's postcentral and parietal lobe. Remember the parietal lobe here is where your primary sensory area is. Here is your primary motor area. Occipital lobe for vision, so it's your visual cortex. Temporal area is for auditory. Also a little bit deeper in here is also for taste. They call it gustation for taste. When we remove the temporal lobe right there, this section is the thalamus, but this highlighted part is called the insula. Inside insula. <clears throat> when we take the brain and open it up and we look at it at the inside, here is the corpus callosum. That's the connection of white matter between the right and left hemispheres. Septum pellucidum is the thin membranous sheath that separates the two ventricles from each other, the two lateral ventricles, septum pellucidum. Here's your fornix, which was part of the limbic system, the emotional brain. Corpus callosum, septum pellucidum. That's why you see lateral ventricle. It separates the two lateral ventricles. And then there's the fornix. You can see the indentation here and here. This is where the two lateral ventricles would be sitting. So this is the cavity of one of the lateral ventricles. Here's the cavity of the, of the other, and the septum pellucidum is what um, separates them. Thalamus for sensory. There's a little seed that you could see there, that little yellow dot. It's called the interthalmic adhesion, interthalmic adhesion. Again, here is the thalamus and the interthalmic adhesion. Below the thalamus is the hypo, hypothalamus. Now, here is the mammillary body. I just don't want you to confuse that 
with what we see on the posterior side, the corpora quadrigemina. That's your superior and inferior colliculi, superior and inferior colliculi. Here's your thalamus. There's the interthalmic adhesion. Under the thalamus is the hypothalamus. Here's the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland, remember, sits in the hypophyseal fossa of the cella tersica. So the pituitary sits in there. The infundibulum is the extension or the stalk that goes from the hypothalamus into the pituitary. That's the long branch for the infundibulum. This is the pineal gland. Remember the pineal? It's more posterior. It's just above the corpora quadrigemina, the superior and inferior colliculi. It's involved in releasing melatonin. It helps tone you down. It helps you sleep at night. Lots of antioxidant properties. Here's the choroid plexus that's surrounding the lateral ventricle. Thalamus, interthalmic adhesion, hypothalamus, choroid plexus, pineal. There's the mammillary body, not to be confused with the superior and inferior colliculi. The superior and inferior colliculi, here's the medulla, here's the pons, here's the midbrain. The midbrain has the superior and inferior colliculi. Again, midbrain, pons, medulla, corpora quadrigemina, superior and inferior colliculi. That's the mammillary body. Thalamus, hypothalamus. Interthalmic adhesion, choroid plexus. Rotating the midbrain to the posterior. So here is what we, this part here is this here. So superior and inferior colliculi, but we're only seeing half the brain. So here's half, here's the other half. So corpora quadrigemina, two superior colliculi, two inferior colliculi. That's the medulla, that's the pons, that's the midbrain. On the, uh, on the medulla, the extended part here they call pyramids. Remember the pyramids was where you had the crisscross, the decussation. Cerebellum, right and left cerebellar hemisphere. Now don't confuse cerebellar hemisphere with cerebral hemisphere. Cerebral means cerebrum. This is a, my left cerebral hemisphere this is my left cerebellar hemisphere. Between the two is the vermis. Here is the cross section of the cerebellum. The arbor vitae or the veins of the leaf is the white matter. And then the cortex is the folia. The outer part is gray matter. The cerebellar cortex is known as folia, like foliage, leaves. The arbor vitae is the vein of the leaf, white matter. Okay, here is that model of the um, ventricles where the cerebral spinal fluid flows through. So here is the lateral ventricles, one and two. Here's the third ventricle. And then at the bottom is the fourth ventricle. Let's look at it up here. From the top view, the two ventricles. To get from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle, it's got to go through the interventricular foramen of Monroe. After it gets into the third ventricle, it can go down into the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia. And then after it gets into the fourth ventricle, it can exit through the lateral 
aperture or the medial aperture. Okay. The, so that's the, the brain. The other one I wanted to cover was the neuron, which should be a little bit repetitious because we did cover this earlier on in the term where we saw this model. And remember when we look at a neuron, we have the, we, we use the hand as the analogy. So this would be the palm of the hand, the fingers of the hand, and then the forearm. So dendrites, soma or cell body, and then axon. So when we look a little bit closer, dendrites, cell body, axon. Here, dendrites, and what's attached to them are these um, axon terminals. And in an axon terminal is neurotransmitters. So you have an axon like this, you have an axon that has this axon terminal and it's going to extend to the dendrites of another. Okay, that's what that's showing. So here's the cell body, here's the nucleus. The cell body is known as the soma. The dilated part of the neuron right here is the beginning of the axon, it's the hill of it, so it's called the axon hillock. The initial segment is where, also known as the trigger zone, that's where depolarization actually takes place. You're gonna learn a little bit more about that in lecture. If you have a difficult time understanding it, let me know, I don't mind going over it with you, but let your lecture professor start um, talking about depolarization and repolarization and what's actually happening in the cell between sodium and potassium for that to happen. And then here's the axon. And then you have this part, the axon is cut, but this part here would be connected here. Does that make sense? So they just cut it to fit it on this plaque. So this is, again, part of the axon. And what we see a lot of inside are mitochondria. And we know how highly um, your, your heart, your muscles, and your neurology have lots of energy. They need lots of energy, so they need lots of mitochondria. What's surrounding these axons in the uh, what's surrounding this axon, which is here, is this protective barrier, this sheath called myelin sheath. Now, the myelin sheath is produced by a type of neuroglial cell called a Schwann cell. The Schwann cell produces this myelin in the peripheral neural system. Oligodendrocytes produce myelin in the central neural system. Let's look here. So here is a nucleus of a Schwann cell. This is, let me see if I can bring this up. This is one Schwann cell. This is another Schwann cell. And it keeps myelinating this segment. Where the two Schwann cells meet is called a node of Ranvier. It's kind of like that indented area here and here. This is the myelin sheath produced by the Schwann cells. Okay, and this is just another model showing the exact same thing. Here's the cell body or the soma. These are the dendrites. This is the nucleus. The beginning is the axon hillock. The beginning of the axon is the initial segment. Then you have an axon, many axons, surrounded by a Schwann cell that produced myelin sheath to protect it. The myelin is the insulator. It speeds up conduction, the impulses. And let me see if there's anything else here. Uh, the only other thing, we did the node of Ranvier Schwann cell. Uh, the endoneurium, where is that? Let me just find where the endoneurium is. There it is. The endoneurium is this, just like with muscle, how there was a endomysium, an epimysium, and perimysium. 
this is the endoneurium, that first layer that protects neurons. Okay, and I think that is it. Let me get this, let me stop the recording here. So today we covered um, brain, all of its functions. We went over the key landmarks. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and we did the neuron. Bless you. Thank you, thank you. Next week we'll do the next week we will do the uh, spinal cord. And the week after maybe a little bit of review. Let's just stop this recording. Just a second.